Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome everybody to this amazing celebration. Everyone, welcome here and also online. We have um, we're doing a hybrid event today, so we're being it's a webinar that's being um, beamed out live. So it's a bit like I just said to Caitlin, a bit like a TV show as well. So um, my name's Sophie Scott, and welcome everyone to the Daffodil Centre anniversary celebration for 2023. For those of you who don't know about the Daffodil, it's a joint venture between the Cancer Council New South Wales and Sydney University. You'll be hearing a lot more about it at this event. Before we get underway, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And this morning is a really special occasion to recognise the second anniversary of the Daffodil Centre. We know that you're all really busy and have really busy work and lives. So we're very grateful that you've taken the time to be with us this morning. You're going to be hearing some amazing early to mid-career researchers talking about their groundbreaking work. And you'll hear a panel discussion from some of Australia's leading experts in cancer control. And as we marvel at the signs we're going to be hearing, it's good to remember that at the heart of everything that so many people in this room do. It's all about improving the lives of patients. At the end of the day, what you do and what your support and the reason that you're here is about the lives that, that you all can save. The patients who will be able to fall in love after a cancer diagnosis and lead a full and productive life. It's about chairs at a dining table that won't be empty thanks to breakthroughs that we're going to hear about today. About families who get to see their children grow up after a childhood cancer diagnosis. So breakthroughs like this can only happen without fantastic work from groups like the Daffodil Centre, Cancer Council New South Wales and Sydney University. And the Daffodil Centre in particular is a unique organisation as you'll hear because it can take groundbreaking research and apply it to public policy to see really meaningful change to move the dial on cancer control. So let's spread the message about what you hear in this room today and what you're hearing online. If you're on Twitter, uh, you can follow the Daffodil Centre on Twitter. It's at Daffodil Centre. If you're on Instagram, you can follow me. My, my um, handle there is at Sophie Scott and the number two. And you can also follow the Cancer Council New South Wales on Instagram. We would love to see your posts and your thoughts about this event. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Michael West from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council for our Welcome to Country. Please give him a big round of applause. Thanks, Sophie. How's everyone this morning? I hope you had a good weekend. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah. Get some rest and everything. Recharged batteries, no doubt. That's so important. Um, I'd like to say Bajadi Gamarua Gadigal Yora and good day and welcome to Gadigal and Yora here. And also it's important, I think, um, with cancer and that that the support is given to not only the person who has cancer but the family as well because it's remember it's they're also impacted too it's important that we do deliver the services in a, a appropriate way um, and it's important with the research too that um, we look at things both in a cultural way and people's identity too is taken into account um, so important and where we are here in sydney this is where it all changed for aboriginal people when you think about it just down there on the harbour do you guys uh, know i'm um, ask what i've been asking is i've been asking people uh, aboriginal culture hasn't really been taught in school it is being taught now um, the curriculum is including it but do you know guys know what a traditional canoe is called in sydney no no way no way um, imagine being out there on a no way, not on a rainy day, but on a beautiful sunny day. We've had the last few weeks um, on that beautiful harbour, which is known around the world, and paddling to the other side of the coat hanger, as we affectionately call it. What is the clan over there? Camaragal, yes. Imagine turning left and I'm paddling along and I look to my left, I'm looking at Darling Harbour. Do you know what that is called, Darling Harbour there? Gomorrah, Gomorrah. Imagine you're there paddling around and then you see a Barani with their calf. What do you think a Barani is? A whale. 
Yes, a whale. Um, resting in there in Darling Harbour with its calf could give birth in there. Um, but whale is part of the totems here in Sydney here um, for the ones around the harbour here. And I'm paddling along after Gomorrah and I look on my left, what clan would that be that starts with W? Wongal, Wongal. And if I'm paddling along and I look on my right, I see I've gone past Camaragal and I'm looking there and I see also W it starts with. Walla Madigal, and that's where Benelong is resting, partner of Barangaroo, a strong Camaragal woman. And if I keep going, what do I eventually hit? They got flogged in the NRL final last year. <laughs> South, <laughs> oh, South, I don't think we're going, we're going inland, we're paddling inland. So, uh, but. <laughs> Parramatta, Parramatta, Barra Mariko, Barra meaning eel, B U R R A, Barra. And there's a whole creation story about Sydney Harbour being created by a giant eel and the waterways, and that is now resting just off of Belmain. There's an island there with, a, with its eye looking up to the sky. Do you know what island that is? No, close. It's named after a four legged animal. Goat Island. Do you know its traditional name? Memel, Memel, M E M E L, Memel. It is transitioning back to the land council because it's a very important cultural place. Those Sydney clans, other Sydney clans would meet on it. So it is very important. And, and learning about our history um, is so important too because our culture and sites are also your culture and sites to protect because we need to protect them for humanity itself when you think about. We do go back more than 65,000 years. It keeps changing. It was, it was like 5,000 at one stage and it keeps going further and further and further. But we say we've been here since the beginning of time and we'll be here to the end of time. Um, I'll get you guys to look at, get your phones out because I'll get you to look up a couple of things. You are, there are researchers here, correct? Who do like, who do like education and um, people, we are in a university um, here, Sydney University, they have a partnership. Now on this side, on my right, I will get you to look at Bree Warrener fish traps, Bree Warrener fish traps, and on my left, I will get you to look at Hunting Bird Manuscript Vatican, Hunting Bird Manuscript Vatican. It does put some context in how long we've been here, but it also puts some context that we've actually done trade up the top up there. Do you know, we did trade up the top for four to 500 years. And what was that with? There was production plants up there. With sea cucumbers, has anybody seen a sea cucumber? Sea cucumber. If you go up um, the barrier reef and go snorkeling, you'll see them. They're quite big, very big. And um, they were a production plant up the top up there, traded with the Macassans, the Indonesians, and up into China. Like, and I made this point last year with the Chinese ambassador and the consuls for the 50th anniversary of Gough going over to open up diplomatic relations. And it's important that we do remember the past and we acknowledge that because we had a relationship built on trade sharing food sharing culture and sharing stories so I said what can the future hold and I think that's important to think about these things so what did you find for Bree Warren of fish traps I am judging you against kids too in school don't be afraid to speak up you didn't, weren't expecting this level of interaction. <laughs> they, yeah, they had some issues, but they're still there. Um, they are. They, I mean, some of it, some of it was destroyed, but they're still there. Um, and they go back. Do you know how long they go back? A long time. Oldest human construction in the world. They're forty thousand years old. Um, they're designed in a way that they channel the fish into ponds so you can just easily pick them up. And then also it's aquaculture and engineering when you think about the science of it. And there are some programs that are on, being created on TV of late, the inventors and weapons and that. So do watch these programs. I'm not saying about, about particular channels. I'm just saying about programs. Yes. <laughs> and what did you find about the hunting bird manuscript in the Vatican? There's a very familiar face, isn't there?
So 13th century, 1241, there is a depiction of Australian cockatoo. And um, if you go, if you do some further research, you'll go forward and you'll actually see these other artworks and, and other, yeah, other artworks that depict Australian animals like the cockatoo. So it's, we weren't just sitting around here, um, we were interacting with the world. And um, also, I think it's important, obviously, that um, we take a moment silence to pay respects to ancestors, pay respects to Mother Earth, because Mother Earth provides us with everything, but we really haven't been looking after her. We should be caring for her because she cares for us. Uh, we really got to get back to that because I think we've seen that with the floods and the firestorms and, and Mother Earth is alive. We do see that with um, the storms that we have, but also earthquakes are just part of living on this planet. We need to remember that. And um, we're here for a short time, but Mother Earth's here for a long time. So um, we need to care for her. We need to pay respects to ancestors. We need to pay respects to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander traditional owners and elders of the past and present. And um, we need to reflect our journey right here, right now, because you are working. I, I know it's not work for you. It's a passion. Uh, and it's very important that we provide the services to those who do um, develop cancer in their families. It's so important. And we remember those we've lost along the way. And the last few years have been difficult. We have seen numbers a lot um, with statistics and everything, but they weren't just per numbers. They were people with names, people with family, people who are part of community. They had their own dreams and aspirations as we all do. So it's important to remember them and take a moment to, to pay respects to them too. So if we have a moment of silence to pay respects and a moment of reflection of our journey that we call life. We have three beautiful waterways of boundaries of the Eora Nation. What are they? N, G, H. What rivers are they? Hawkesbury, Nepean, Georges. Yes. Um, on behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, we'd like to welcome any of our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters here or online. Um, we welcome you from your country your clan, your tribe, your nation, and to all our brothers and sisters, remember we all belong to one big mob, don't we? And what's that? I don't hear with a lot of academics. <laughs> Starts with H, I'm giving you a hint there. Humanity, humanity, we all belong to humanity. Um, so on behalf of, and we welcome you from your family, your neighbourhood, your community, ultimately the country you come from. On behalf of Metropods and Local Aboriginal Link Council, our elders and members welcome here, continue the good work that you're doing. And it's important that we follow um, the data, we follow the facts to make informed decisions. And we've seen that the last few years getting through this pandemic, which we're not quite through, are we? No, and um, we need to remember that. And when you don't follow the data, that's when you tell people to inject themselves with bleach. And yes, we did see that in the pandemic, didn't we? quite shocking and disturbing, but that's not good leadership. Good leadership is about sympathy, empathy, compassion, being able to lead, follow, but lead to follow at the, um, depending. And also about hearing, but more than that, listening and taking it on board and understanding and about being a good communicator. Um, and we need to build the capacity of those around us and just be better better people, treat people with dignity and respect always, treat people the way you want to be treated. And um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land never ceded. Let's walk together and work together for better outcomes. I know someone said, if you don't, we've got a referendum coming up, obviously, Voice Treaty Truth. I'm not telling you way to vote. Um, but if you are researchers and you are academics, isn't it important that you do look at the information and make informed decisions? It's so important that we do make informed decisions. I know someone said, if you don't know, vote no. Isn't it say, if you don't know, remain ignorant? Yes, we should learn about the facts and make informed decisions in our lives. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. Um, glad you had a great weekend. Sorry, it's a bit rainy outside, but um, enjoy. Thanks.
very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And I think uh, that was a beautiful welcome to country. I think we all need to do a little bit better for next year, though, to, on some of those um, those questions. And I think it's 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 actually a bit of a sad reflection on the lack of education on Indigenous issues that we don't all know all the Aboriginal names of our areas and things like that. So everyone is learning, and I think it's a hopefully if we, if you come back next year, Michael, we we'll hope we'll hopefully do better. So. Let's make that one of our goals to do better next year, but because I think um, we can all we can all improve. But thank you, thank you for that, Michael. We appreciate your time today and and for getting us to think a little bit deeply about things. So our next speaker has worked as a senior executive, a researcher, and a clinician across cancer, pediatric palliative care, and eye health. Please welcome the Cancer Council New South Wales CEO, Professor Sarah Hosking. Give her a round of applause, Sarah. Well, thank you, Sophie, and uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us in this meeting. Distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, thank you so much for attending today's event. It's a little hard to believe it's now just a little bit more than two years since the, the Daffodil Centre was launched by New South Wales Minister for Health, the Honourable Brad Hazard. Um, it's two years, it's a long time. And at that time, the launch was hosted by, uh, for Sydney University, Professor Robin Ward, and for the Cancer Council New South Wales, my predecessor as CEO, Mr. Jeff Mitchell. And I'm sorry that neither of them can be here today, but I just wanted to give a shout out and acknowledgement to both of them for their incredible contributions over the time. In that two years, we've seen a lot of change. We have seen changes in government at both state and federal levels. Uh, and we have welcomed a number of new parliamentarians who, uh, who have a stake in what we do in research, in independent cancer research, but also the translation through to improved outcomes. We appreciate the strong support of, for our work across uh, the political spectrum and across jurisdictions at both state and federal level. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognise the contributions of those in community who help us to progress what we do. Uh, individuals, of course, and organisations like Cancer Voices who make such a difference in making sure that we keep focused and keep on message in terms of the work we do. I acknowledge our long-standing volunteers. There are so many of them and they do an incredible job for us. And also our donors and partners whose generous gifts support the cancer breakthroughs of the future. There are several who can't be with us today, but I do want to make a few call outs of some of our key long term partners uh, in funding our organization and our work in research. Uh, and as I say in the game shows, in no particular order, the Fussell Family Foundation, Alison Ross and the Ross family, Max Schroeder and Julie Hannaford, the Bell Elbury Foundation, James Freeman and the Box Rallies community, Dr. John Mayo and the Mindaroo Foundation. So really, thank you so much for all of your incredible contributions. It makes such a big difference. Now I'm going to be leaving it to our Daffodil Centre leader and director, Professor Karen Kamfeld, to talk to you um, a in a little bit more detail about some of the progress that's been made in the centre across the last two years. But before we go there, just want to reflect um, as CEO of the Cancer Council New South Wales, and as you know, we are the largest cancer charity and one of Daffodil Centre's two joint partners uh, being Cancer Council, as well as the University of Sydney. What strikes me most about the first two years in the life of the Cancer, cancer Centre, the Daffodil Centre, is the importance and scale of, of the work that we do and how that has grown over the time. Over the past two years, it's worth remembering that 300,000 new cancer diagnoses have taken place in Australia, and about 100,000 of those are here in New South Wales. Almost 100,000 Australians have lost their lives to cancer, and about two in three of those are here in New South Wales. This time last year, the Daffodil Centre published a land, landmark paper by Dr. Ching-Wei Luo. You'll hear more about this paper, an absolutely incredible piece of work, um, and it predicts the trends in cancer incidents across the country between 2020 and 2044. It's probably the most sophisticated analysis of its kind that's been published in Australia, and it provides an unprecedented insight into the challenges over the next two decades. These challenges include the fact that over four and a half million people will have a new diagnosis of cancer in that period, and around one and a half million people will die from cancer. Just to give that a bit of a human perspective while we reflect for a moment, 
I think just about everybody in this room has been touched by cancer in some way, whether you've been a patient, a friend or carer, um, whether you've been bereaved through cancer, we've all been touched in some way. And if you reflect on how that's impacted on you and you times that by four and a half million diagnoses or one and a half million deaths, that's an awful lot of trauma over the coming years and an awful lot of grief and loss. So very, something to really think about. But despite the challenges, there have been some great new positive insights from the data that we've seen. At last year's event, I touched on a couple of great stories, actually, um, and examples of the success of recent years. A notable one is that Australian men in early middle age are half as likely to die from lung cancer or melanoma compared with men um, from their father's generation. That's a huge generational shift. So there's no doubt at all that what's happening makes a really big difference. There is no doubt that independent cancer council research and advocacy led many of the reforms and interventions that have driven mortality rates down. On our projections, these results will continue to improve as the longer term benefits of cancer prevention will take effect. And yet, we still face around 275,000 deaths in all Australians from lung cancer and melanoma combined to 2044. That's despite the fact that four in five of these are preventable. If governments and communities had invested at optimal levels in cancer prevention in previous generations, the mortality reductions we have identified, impressive though they are, would be even greater. We've set the dial and we have to step up to strengthen the linkages between independent research and advocacy to drive change with renewed urgency. That link linkage is, the central, is central to the Daffodil Centre's strategic research framework. Setting the dial, based on powerful insights in, into the immediate and longer term future, takes us to the theme of today's events, moving the dial in cancer control. Cancer incidence and mortality, although the strongest indicators and some of the easiest and cleanest indicators to monitor, they're only part of the story. We know that gaps in outcomes are set to widen between cancer types, stage of diagnosis, and according to a range of de demographic indicators. These moving pieces must be seen in the context of estimates that around 400,000 people living in New South, alone, New South Wales alone have at some time been diagnosed with a potentially fatal cancer. It's likely to be around 630,000 people by 2040, if nothing changes. Of these, some are in active treatment, some are receiving end of life care, but many are living their lives post-treatment. Their support needs vary widely. There is no doubt that for all of them, life will have changed significantly when they heard those three words, you have cancer. Setting the dial to change outcomes requires a busy, complex series of interventions. We must in fact set a number of dials to maximize our impact in independent cancer research and its translation to policy, practice, and most importantly, to outcomes. Outcomes in terms of lives saved, extended, and lives improved. We all have a role in these challenges. Like the Daffodil Centre itself, partnership and collaboration will be the key to impact and outcomes. So it's an honour to be here talking to you today, knowing that you all have a stake in moving these dials as we lead the way to a cancer-free future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. There were some very sobering statistics there, but also some reason for hope as well and also just really reinforcing the importance of prevention, which we're gonna talk about in our panel discussion. So from antibiotic resistance in Vietnam to water management to control disease outbreaks in Fiji, which is where I was last week, um, our next speaker has devoted his life to ensuring a healthier world for all. He's the Deputy Executive Dean for Academics here at Sydney University. Please welcome Professor Joel Negan. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. And I'd like to also acknowledge in that, that uh, for me growing up in Canada, I learned absolutely nothing about the First Nations people of the Toronto area where I grew up. My kids now in a school just up the road here would have passed that test uh, much better than I think we would have uh, in the room. So you, you made the point about it's in the curriculum now. Our kids are learning about it. 
the next generation will be um, acing that test, I'm sure. So I certainly hope so. I wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners um, and acknowledge that we're on Gadigal land. Um, thank you, Sarah, for your opening comments. They paint a formidable and compelling picture of the challenges in cancer control. Uh, from the perspective of the state's largest and oldest cancer charity and community-based cancer research organization. It's a privilege for me to be here today representing uh, Executive Dean Robin Ward and the wider faculty of medicine and health. Uh, an opportunity for me to add a University of Sydney perspective to the challenges and opportunities before us and how coming together as a joint venture is enabling us to step forward and meet these challenges. So from the state's largest and oldest cancer charity to Australia's largest and oldest university and faculty of medicine and health. Um, it's wonderful to be here on this second birthday of the Daffodil Center. And there's no other cancer research center in Australia and possibly the world quite like the Daffodil Center. The joint venture is innovative. It's a positive model focused on impact. And it's very exciting to bring together these two organizations. The Daffodil Center has achieved a great deal in just two years. I do want to acknowledge that success is built on many years of collaborative work predating the establishment uh, of the center. And many of us in the room here today were involved in those early discussions, which were collaborative, but also very complex. But they were done in a spirit of collegiality. Um, and I'd like to say that all of our negotiations and discussions could be done in that kind of spirit. Um, I think we'd all probably appreciate that. Um, so it's great to be here to celebrate that birthday. As I mentioned, the Affidale Center builds on a long history and a great track record of collaboration between our two organizations. For many years, senior academics from the University of Sydney, in particular from the School of Public Health, held key governance, leadership, and advisory roles in the Cancer Council. We can acknowledge Emeritus Professor Simon Chapman, Bruce Armstrong, and Professors Tim Driscoll and Jane Young, uh, who contributed uh, and collaborated between the Cancer Council of New South Wales and the University of Sydney. And likewise, many distinguished researchers at the Cancer Council have had academic appointments at the university, have supervised students, contributed to course material, and collaborated on projects. So the prospect of formally partnering through a cancer research joint venture presented a unique opportunity to advance and scale up our joint interests and creating the highest quality independent cancer research prioritized for translation into policy and practice and impact. So to my mind, the center's achievements in these two years have delivered on the promise outlined in that strategic vision. And I think we can agree have exceeded our expectations. There's been a huge amount of success in a number of the um, competitive research schemes, um, NHMRC, MRFF, and so on. More importantly, game-changing outcomes in policy and practice in areas such as lung cancer, bowel, breast, cervical cancer screening, uh, some already achieved, some still in development. They've been informed by the research done by people in the room today and the uh, members of this joint venture. Last year, the center also published the most compelling evidence to date on the impact of diets and obesity on cancer incidents in Australia, which supports our collaborative work on improving outcomes for multiple disease types, and also starts to reach into the other research that is done here at the University of Sydney um, and collaborating with other groups within the university, which was always part of the promise of the collaboration. I'm really proud of the work of our early career academics, the PhD students that have come through this program. Ultimately, the University of Sydney is an educational institution, and so we take very seriously the opportunities and responsibilities that we have in educating that next generation uh, of leaders. And we're gonna hear from a number of them today, which I think is a great model for how the Daffodil Center presents its face moving forward. Um, as noted, the Daffodil Center is one of the Faculty of Medicine and Health's flagship centers. Our flagship centers are um, the groups within our faculty who lead uh, our research endeavors. They're the best of the faculty. They fly the flag, hence flagship, for the university in terms of impact, excellence, and rigor. We're very proud of them, uh, and we like to highlight their successes. All of our flagship centers have a shared focus on innovation, strategy, collaboration, and research translation, and global impact. The impact and success of these centers is part of the reason the University of Sydney jumped 22 places to be ranked 19th on the prestigious independent QS World University rankings. 
It's a great achievement and reflects, among other things, our increasing stake in promoting global health. It also reflects the global reach and opportunity of the Daffodil Center. As Sarah noted, the statistics are quite sobering. According to the World Health Organization, cancer caused almost 10 million deaths worldwide in 2020. So while much of the focus is rightly on what we can do in Australia, the Daffodil Center is taking its insights around the world in a collaborative collegial manner, supporting cancer initiatives in neighboring countries and beyond. Many of the breakthroughs needed to address the daunting numbers in Australia flagged by Sarah will be the result of global collaborations. We will learn from the rest of the world and vice versa. With these challenges, of course, come opportunities. And the Daffodil Center uh, is in a wonderful shape to build on its achievements in its first two years. And that's what uh, Karen will now highlight, and which will enable us to lead the way in moving the dial in cancer control. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Negan. I'm now delighted to welcome our next speaker. She's an epidemiologist, a population health researcher with a special expertise in cancer screening. She's the inaugural director of the Daffodil Center. Please welcome Professor Karen Canfell. Thank you so much, Sophie. And thank you very much, Sarah and Joel, for the perspectives of, um, of the Cancer Council of New South Wales and the University of Sydney. We gratefully acknowledge your support of the center. Thank you also, um, Michael, for your warm and very educational welcome to country. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation today. So on behalf of everyone at the Daffodil Centre, I express my great appreciation to both organisations for their support over the last two years. And this extends to senior management at the university and also to the board of Cancer Council New South Wales who supported our vision for the centre. We're also extremely grateful to our philanthropic research funders whom Sarah's already acknowledged and pleased to be able to summarise the results that we've achieved in the first two years of operation today. But first, I want to take the opportunity to thank the Daffodil Centre staff, both academic and professional, for their outstanding efforts over the last two years. I'd like to particularly thank Professor Anne Cust and Karen Hill, who've co-led the development of the centre with me. So Anne is the Deputy Director and Karen is our wonderful Manager of Operations. And I'd like to thank the organising committee for today's event, Caitlin Ward, Millie Hanlon, Alison McGregor and Adam Borsek. Thanks so much for your efforts. I'd also like to acknowledge the passing last year of one of the centre's greatest supporters, Professor Dame Valerie Beryl of the University of Oxford, whose advice and leadership helped us set the agenda for the Daffodil Centre. And in doing so, I'd like to welcome one of Valerie's past mentees, Professor Emily Banks, who'll be joining us as a special guest on our panel later this morning. So cancer research that translates to measurably improved outcomes requires highly skilled and dedicated researchers at all levels and professional staff to support them. And you'll hear, as Joel said, shortly from some of our early and mid-career researchers and also from some of our senior researchers and stream leads shortly. But for now, I'm going to try and give you a snapshot of the center work more broadly. So there are a number of ways that we can measure success and I'm proud to say that I think our centre is achieving beyond expectations on all of them. Firstly, some of those achievements are self-explanatory. In two years, we've published 342 peer-reviewed scientific papers published in quality journals. We've awarded five domestic Daffodil Centre research scholarships and two international PhD scholarships. Our funders now include the NHMRC, the MRFF, Cancer Institute New South Wales, Cancer Australia, the National, Institute, National Cancer Institute in the US, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Health Organization. And we've had success in 76 individual research grants and contracts for government, totaling over $17 million in funding commitments to the center. Scaling up the capacity and synergizing the input of the two joint venture partners was a core aim of the centre and we are achieving it. We've also grown structurally to extend our research capacity and reach with the establishment I'm really pleased to announce of two new research streams this year, 
one focused on tobacco behavior change and the other on innovation, implementation and impact, our new triple I stream. These are working across all areas of cancer control policy and practice. And these new streams are led by Professor Megan Passy and Associate Professor Ben, Stritz, ben Smith. And we warmly welcome Megan and Ben and their teams to the Daffodil Centre this year. We're also growing in the development of our staff and have been delighted to celebrate the promotions of Eleonora Folletto, Michael Caruana, and Julia Steinberg to the level of Associate Professor this year. Julia, as well as Dr. Tong Lee, also received prestigious Cancer Institute New South Wales fellowships over the past year. And we're also so proud of Dr. Kate Smith, who has just been announced, has been selected as a member of the Young Leaders Program run by the International Union of Cancer Control or UICC. There are too many achievements to discuss in detail today, so I will try to paint a picture just by snapshotting a selection, which takes us back to the theme of today's celebration, moving the dial in cancer control. Moving that dial, it does involve an intricate dashboard, and there are many indicators that need to move to show that we as a community invested in improved cancer control outcomes are succeeding. In relation to this, I'm so especially proud of the work of our wonderful research fellow, Dr. Ching Wei Lu, who you've heard about from Sarah. And as you've heard, and you hear from Ching Wei herself in a moment, she's led a landmark Lancet Public Health study last year, which showed in more detail than any other study published in Australia, what the future burden of cancer will look like over the next two decades. This shows us like no other research, where the dial in cancer control has moved and can, will continue to move on current trends. It's a complex dashboard, but there are some general findings which tell an important story. We do face increasing numbers of cancer cases and deaths as our population grows and ages, but the age standardized rates of death will continue to decline. So this is provisionally good news, but the death rates are not falling quickly enough. The daunting numbers of cancer cases and deaths that we have projected are based on the continuation of existing trends. In other words, they're the future that Australia faces if nothing else changes. You've heard it already, 4.5 million cancer cases, 1.56 million cancer deaths by 2044, an enormous burden. And this is where actively moving the dial comes in. The drivers of that shift will be the cancer research sector supported by effective evidence-based advocacy. I'm so proud to be able to say today, in only two years of operating, the Daffodil Centre has already published research, which when embedded into policy and practice will change the future for the better. As one example, for the foreseeable future, lung cancer will remain the leading cause of cancer death in Australia. Yet lung cancer, along with melanoma, will also see the largest overall decline in death rates up to 2044, most of that driven by prevention. And this tells us a number of things. Prevention works, but it can take a long time for the benefits to appear in the mortality data. We need to do more, and we also need to do more in early detection for lung cancer. Targeted lung cancer screening is expected to be a game changer in Australia. Economic analysis published by the Daffodil Centre last year played an important role in the Australian government's decision to announce a national lung cancer screening program from July 2025, as announced by Federal Health Minister Mark Butler in this year's budget. This year, we also supported the Commonwealth Government and Cancer Council Australia in the development of a roadmap for liver cancer control in Australia, alongside new NHMRC endorsed guidelines for surveillance of liver cancer. These show the way forward for moving the dial where it is most urgently needing to shift since liver cancer deaths have been increasing and also disproportionately impacting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, as well as migrant communities. Thirdly, since last year's event and supported by our work, Australia's National Cervical Screening Program has introduced universal self-collection for HPV, set to significantly improve access in the program for underscreened populations. 
And this builds on our previous work to inform the screening program's transition from two yearly pap smears to five yearly HPV testing. The dial for eliminating cervical cancer in Australia has been set and our work is moving that dial, not only in Australia, but worldwide, infor informing the World Health Organization's global strategy for the elimination of cervical cancer. We're especially grateful for the support of the Minderu Foundation, as noted by Sarah, for funding our expansion of this work into the Western Pacific region and beyond in areas where cervical cancer imposes a terrible burden on communities. Our research streams in breast, prostate and bowel cancer have led advances in their tumor specific fields this year as well. And our ovarian cancer stream is also leading innovative research in ovarian cancer control. And we gratefully thank the Fussell Family Foundation for supporting this work. The seven cancer types I've just touched on together account for about half of cancer deaths in Australia. We're working to find new ways to prevent them, to detect them early when they're easier to treat and to improve system level access to treatment and care to bring about change that will save tens of thousands and more lives at a time. Our cross-cutting themes of work and our new triple I and supportive care research streams are also prioritizing the collection of evidence on ways to improve the quality of life for everyone affected by cancer. So thank you again for all your support. Together, we can drive the changes in healthcare policy and practice that are needed to move the dial in cancer control. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. Thank you so much, Karen, for really highlighting just the amazing work that the Daffodil Centre is doing. And, and I'm so glad you mentioned lung cancer screening because when we had the first event here, when the Daffodil Centre was being launched, having the targeted lung cancer screening was on the agenda, it was on the wish list, and now it's happening. So it just shows you that, you know, in a very short time, things have changed and it's really thanks to um, the people in this room. So as Karen mentioned, we're now going to hear from the early to mid-career researchers about the amazing work that they're doing. Our first speaker is an early career researcher with expertise in epidemiology and qualitative research. Please welcome Dr. Amelia Smith. Thanks so much for that introduction, Sophie. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to present some of my research here today. So thank you so much for the opportunity. So melanoma presents a substantial burden to the Australian community. And as we're about to hear more, this burden is projected to increase over the next two decades. There are calls to improve primary prevention behaviors, particularly among high-risk groups. And we have a growing population of melanoma survivors who are at very high risk of other skin cancers and also of subsequent melanomas. And the risk of mortality increases with each subsequent melanoma. Although prevention behaviors are critically important among these um, patients, we do have evidence of suboptimal uh, sun habits, including sunburns. And Fear of cancer occurrence is a commonly reported challenge among people who have had melanoma. And alongside psychoeducational support to um, reduce the impact of fear of cancer occurrence, personalised photo protection advice is also recommended, particularly to support active lifestyles whilst also being sun smart. So our team has developed the SunWise strategy, and this is a behaviour change theory driven strategy to support sun safe behaviours among melanoma survivors. It involves wearing a sun watch for seven days, which has a UV sensor and LED light embedded. And this is the latest technology in UV sensing that we have here in Australia. And we're collaborating with an electrical engineer at Macquarie University in the nanotech lab there, who is working on this study with us. So the LED light issues a warning based on uh, thresholds in the UV index and as you can see here, the corresponding uh, protection recommendations. Patients will also receive personalized SMS reminders and two educational booklets on prevention and early detection. 
So we will evaluate the Sunwise strategy in an Australian first randomized controlled trial of this type of personalized multimodal sun protection strategy. We have a target sample size of just over 400 patients and we will conduct the study later this year over the spring and summer months. We're recruiting melanoma patients attending dermatology clinics at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and Melanoma Institute Australia and also up in Queensland at Townsville Hospital. The primary outcome for the study is total daily UV exposure, which will be objectively measured in standard erythemal doses by UV decimeters, which are also worn on the wrist. And the secondary outcomes for the study include a range of behavioral and psychological outcomes, as well as costs and satisfaction with the Sunwise strategy. So thinking about the implications of this work, this type of personalized prevention has the potential to reduce skin cancer risk among a very high risk group and also support an active lifestyle um, while also being sun safe. This type of intervention could be incorporated into shared cancer follow-up and survivorship care, including for other high risk patient groups, such as organ transplant recipients, or other patient groups undergoing treatment which increase their photosensitivity. The findings from this work will inform a hybrid implementation and effectiveness trial that I'm planning around the use of UV sensors and wearables, and that will be a for a future NHMRC IDEAS grant application. So I would just like to acknowledge the very multidisciplinary team of investigators working on this study, which includes dermatologists, electrical engineers, cancer epidemiologists, and health economists, and also the melanoma consumers in research group at the Melanoma Institute Australia, and also the funding bodies. And lastly, thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia, that was fascinating. I actually, I, I did a presentation on the future of health and it was all about wearables. So hearing about your work in that area is, um, is spot on because that's certainly where health is going. We're all going to be wearing things that are telling us stuff that we probably don't want to know. <laughs> They're good on you. So our next speaker, as you've heard, has um, had some amazing findings coming out recently, but she's also led projects to investigate the risk of prostate and bowel cancer progressing and also quantifying the urban and rural disparities in cancer outcomes. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ching-Wei Luau. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, and also thank you so much, Sarah and Karen mentioned this study. So today I will be presenting some highlights from our study um, on the project projections of future cancer incidence and mortality in Australia. So as I mentioned, this paper was published in the Lancet Public Health in 2022. Um, and I would like to acknowledge all my co-authors and uh, especially thanks to a Professor Julia and the Professor Karen <laughs> Campbell, thank you. So this, the, the primary aim of this study was to construct baseline projections of incidence and the mortality rate for 21 cancer types and all cancers combined in Australia to 2044, using the data on cancer incidence and mortality up to 2019, and accounting for some crucial cancer-specific factors, including smoking intensity, participation rates in breast cancer screening, and the PSA testing rates. Um, we build and develop models for each of the 21 cancer types and all cancers combined by males and females separately. However, today I just only gave some highlights from the results for males and the females combined in next two slides. So this figure shows the age standardized the incidence and the mortality rates for all cancers combined and the 21 cancer types to 2044. So the blue lines present the projected incidence rate and the red lines present the projected mortality rate. So you can see the age standardized the incidence and the mortality rates for all cancers combined are projected to decline as mentioned you know, in previously. Um, there are a number of cancer types 
where both incidence and mortality rates are projected to decline or to be relatively stable. However, you can see from how our projections suggest some notable increases in cancer incidence, uh, including cancers of female breast, kidney, liver, um, pancreas, thyroid, and the uterus, and a notable increase in mortality rate for liver cancer. So now we will look at the cancer burden over the 25 year projection period from 2020 to 2044. Despite the declining rate in cancer incidence and mortality for all cancers combined, our projections suggest that the annual number of year cancer cases and cancer deaths in Australia will continue to increase substantially. For cancer incidence on the left side, the cancers of the prostate, female breast, melanoma, colorectum, and the lung are expected to be remaining the top five commonly diagnosed cancer and account for over 55% of all cancer cases. On the right side, for mortality, cancers of the lung, colorectum, prostate, pancreas, and female breast are projected to be the top five common causes of cancer deaths and account for almost half of all cancer deaths in Australia. So this is expected to result in a total of 4.56 million cancer cases and 1.45 million cancer deaths as highlighted previously by Sarah and Karen. So these pro baseline projections can help inform health service planning to meet the requirement for future cancer care and also can serve as benchmarks against which to measure the impact of future cancer prevention and the intervention initiatives. Thank you for your attention. And now I hand over to Sarah. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Dr. Luo. And there's some, again, some very sobering statistics there. And and I just note, um, I'm an ambassador for Bowel Cancer Australia, so I always just like to mention, um, you could see in that analysis there, the, the, the burden of colorectal and bowel cancer was about 10%. Um, so if you do get that, when you get that test in the mail, do the test. Do not throw it in the bin like a lot of Australians do. Um, that, that's why I got involved with Bowel Cancer Australia to really raise the awareness of screening. We have a great test for bowel cancer. We just need to get people to use it and not put it in the bin. So, um, and then hopefully we could see that um, either those, those rates go down. So our next presenter is a postdoctoral researcher. He's investigated the health economics of lung cancer control policies, such as tobacco control and lung cancer screening. Please welcome Preston No. Hello. Um, so my talk's going to be, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my talk's going to be about tracking innovations in lung cancer treatment through simulation modeling. Um, and unfortunately, every lung cancer talk always has to start with a very depressing uh, slide. Uh, so as Karen mentioned, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death, killing one Australian every 40 minutes. And only 20% of patients live to the fifth year after diagnosis. So it's a predominantly lethal disease. And there are many ways we can tackle lung cancer. Prevention, uh, we know, goes a very long way in the form of tobacco control, and soon um, in the form of uh, CT screening as well. But the truth is not all lung cancers can in fact be prevented and not all are gonna be caught early. So there's always gonna be a place for uh, systemic therapies in uh, late stage disease. So how are we looking on that front? Well, 10 years ago, uh, this would have been the treatment algorithm for lung cancer, where patients would have predominantly expected to receive chemotherapy, and there were really only just the first appearances of targeted therapies um, in the second line setting. If we fast forward 10 years, the treatment um, landscape has completely transformed with the arrival of a whole host of uh, immunotherapies and targeted therapies, targeting a whole range of uh, an expanding range of indications. And the implications have been quite um, uh, dramatic. So um, in terms of survival, patients are living longer and longer. 
Um, but the costs uh, accompanying these uh, innovations have also been quite substantial. So on the right, I've got uh, PBS expenditure on lung cancer related therapies uh, over the last decade and a half. And uh, you can see since 2017, there's really been a substantial uh, growth in spending on lung cancer drugs. And because these changes have been so rapid, the consequences for decision making aren't actually uh, very well known because uh, we now no longer know how much it costs to treat a lung cancer patient or how long a lung cancer patient can really expect to live. Uh, and this gets in the way of health budget planning and um, evaluations of preventative interventions, such as uh, tobacco control and screening. Uh, and we still need to make decisions on these uh, important issues. So we need a way to anticipate uh, the impact of these new treatments without having to wait for mature data to arrive. And so that's why we developed the TXM model. So TXM is a discrete event simulation that models lung cancer treatment over multiple lines of therapy, and it brings together data from clinical trials, observational studies, uh, PBS and MBS, um, as well as cancer biology data and expert clinical opinion, and it outputs stage four survival and costs. As with any good model, lung, um, sorry, TXM is um, validated. Uh, what we did was we went to the literature and identified real world studies that reported both treatment patterns and survival outcomes. And we uh, replicated those treatment patterns with the model to see if we can get the same survival outcomes. And um, if you're confused uh, with the <laughs> image on the right, essentially, we just want the red lines passed through all the black dots. And that's, for the most part, what we got. Um, and just as an aside, if you want to make an epidemiologist happy, just show them a line passing through a series of dots. Instant dopamine. OK, so um, so with a validated model, we could uh, we can then go on to generate predictions. Uh, under the 2022 treatment uh, standard of care, uh, we expect uh, there to be substantial improvements in one and two year survival, um, almost doubling. Uh, but five year survival, unfortunately, remains quite low. And accompanying this is a substantial increase in costs compared to pre-2016 uh, estimates. But that's just lung cancer in the aggregate. And as I showed before, the treatment algorithm has really uh, become complex. So if we look at specific molecular subpopulations, the outcomes are really quite dramatic, um, where patients receiving targeted therapies see much better survival outcomes, um, but also accrue substantial costs as well, um, compared to a disease like small cell lung cancer, which um, despite the arrival of immunotherapies, still has a very poor prognosis. So to summarize, there have been rapid innovations in lung cancer treatment, um, and this has rendered existing data out of date, um, which causes problems for decision making, uh, which need relevant information relating to current standard of care. Uh, and simulation models uh, help us uh, meet this need. Thank you very much. Fascinating, some fascinating insights there. Thank you very much. So imagine that there was an intervention that could improve your mood, improve your cognitive function, and could even reduce some of the effects of cancer treatment. Well, there is. It's exercise. <laughs> if it was in a pill, we'd all be prescribed it. Um, but it's something our next speaker knows a lot about. Dr. David Mizrahi is an accredited exercise physiologist. His main research topic is focusing on exercise during and after cancer treatment for both child and adult survivors. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction and for the invitation to speak today. It's so wonderful just to get together and have everyone in this uh, one building where we can mingle. So I really enjoy it. Um, I'm, re I'm going to take a slight bit of a tangent to, to the others. I, I really enjoyed their presentations, but I'm going to give a little bit of an update about my research, but just some other academic activities I've been up to over the past 12 months. So this time last year, I was in countryside rural Pennsylvania, a place called Hershey, you all know it, Hershey Chocolates. And that's where I was at the Hershey Chocolate Factory. So I was on my Fulbright Fellowship. Thank you so much to Sydney Uni for the support and letting me um, have this adventure with my family and um, my wife and kid. And I spent um, four months at St. Jude's Children's Hospital, a world leading uh, pediatric childhood cancer center. And they really specialize in exercise and childhood cancer. It was a wonderful experience for me. I had a lot of academic freedom to go all around the US to share my knowledge and passion for exercise and cancer to try and promote um, nurses and doctors and um, communities to promote exercise. As you said, it's such a beneficial thing that everyone can really do. 
Um, I went all over. I was in um, Hawaii and I wore my Hawaiian shirt to give a talk at Hawaii Cancer Center. I had some conferences in San Diego and um, the one picture of the tweet is just really, um, I guess, gives um, gratitude to, to the power of science communication. So I, I had this opportunity to go around the US and I put it on my Twitter, who wants me basically? And the, the leader of uh, the exercise oncology world globally reached out, said, come stay with me in, in Pennsylvania. She said, I stayed at her house. It was, it was a real um, global highlight for me um, in, in my career to, to spend time with her. And lots of things stem from this fellowship. So uh, although it's only short, I gave lectures all over the country. I was interviewed a really great patient podcast in Pennsylvania, and I got invited to three three pay, um, different papers. But one of them was um, from Holland. When I got there, they said, do you want to come to Holland for three days to Utrecht to a, a late effects conference? I said, of course, why would I not want to do that? And during that conference, even though I was only presenting a poster, during the break, I, I bumped into the, uh, the leader of the guidelines committee who was developing new guidelines for health behaviors and childhood cancer. And I just asked, can I, can I please join this committee? I've never been on clinical guidelines before. And, and, and she said, yes, so now I'm actively working on contributing to that project. So really exciting that something has um, stemmed from after that. Here's a picture of where we went in Arkansas. We actually got lost in Arkansas on this hike. It was supposed to be one hour, it turned into six and a lot of hungry and angry children, <laughs> but um, we got home safely. Uh, another thing I did last year uh, and beginning of this year was um, I was the lead e editor on a special edition of Frontiers and Pediatrics for childhood cancer and exercise. It's a much smaller field than in the adult world because it's, it's hard to do research for, for kids because it's much smaller population and they can be quite sick and there's all different ages to do exercise with. So it's very challenging to do good research. So I brought together um, some colleagues, a, a colleague of mine from Germany and one from Canada, other postdocs as well. And we led this uh, special edition. It was really exciting to, um, I guess, an academic experience for myself to put together this special edition of fo focusing on new trials and, and some studies that have been done in the, in the area and um, to get, I guess, a landscape of, of the field and set up for the future, how we can improve the lives of children with cancer. And more things stem from this, which was really cool. I went to Auckland last year as a keynote um, speaker, and then I gave a couple of midnight presentations in the, in the UK and US, um, but really exciting to, I guess, get more of a footprint on this space. And it's gonna lead me into future work, which I'll speak about in a second too. Right now, snapshot of my current work. So um, I have had the privilege as a research fellow in the DC of, of organizing my own work and then linking with the other researchers across the different streams and hubs. And one of them was this meta-analysis, which I wanted to know, can exercising during cancer treatment, as well as the benefits that you said, can it actually reduce the rate of hospitalization? Can it keep patients out of hospital if they don't need to be hospitalized? Or if they're in there for you know a month or two for a bone marrow transplant, can it get them home a couple of days earlier? That will save the, the government thousands and thousands of dollars when we're talking about how many patients um, nationally are, are getting diagnosed. So we found 20 um, randomized trials um, that found there was a small but significant effect um, that exercise actually kept people out of hospital by about 10% and a day and a half on average less um, being hospitalized in their, um, during their cancer therapy. So that's really exciting. And here's a very, very old photo of me, but I have to put that up. Another exciting project I'm doing is my first foray into the 45 and up um, study looking at digital health. And so seeing um, the, the uptake and usage of technologies such as smartphones, fitness trackers, um, digital app use. And, and these are really important. These were really uptaken a lot during the COVID times so people really harness this technology and how, and, and, and it guns the question for us now, how can we use these technologies to motivate and inspire our communities, particularly older populations to uptake better lifestyle behaviors and reduce the risk of cancer and other chronic diseases. So that, that work is in progress, progress now, and we're really excited um, to progress it forward. And thank you to my awesome uh, working group who I've been working on for this paper. But all in the meantime, I've been working towards my, my key goal, which is to, to promote exercise in cancer care and with a focus on ch childhood cancer. And uh, recently we've partnered with Camp Quality, the childhood cancer charity, and they do a range of different programs and services and they do camps all over the state and the country. And they're super keen to get involved with us exercise researchers to uh, promote exercise during their camp, measure it, see if it's effective, follow up the kids with virtual calls and see if we can actually change their behavior. Because these children are up to five, 15 times likely to develop cardiovascular disease compared to their healthy children, uh, healthy friends. So if we can reduce that, 
by getting them a lifelong of exercise rather than um, letting them, I guess, rest and protect them. And, and they have problems when they go back to school, they fall further behind their peers. So can we use this program to inspire them um, to become more active? So we're really, really excited to work with them. They, they ha we have support with them and, and we're just developing the protocol and ethics at the moment. We have three different grants that are under review at the moment, um, major ones and, and seed funding. And that's um, that was started by um, Professor Alex Martinuk. She's got some students um, and also looking to engage with the students here at the university. So really excited for 2024, what will come. Um, the sky's the limit, hopefully. Uh, that's all I have. Um, thank you again so much for having me today and really excited to chat with you more. Thank you very much, David. Fascinating and um, what an amazing year you've had. And, and I also wanted to say that's fantastic that you were able to get um, have such a great time overseas through science communication, even though Twitter's not what it used to be, but there are so many great um, scientists and researchers um, on social media. And so it's always great for me as a science communicator to see people really using that platform and, and getting the benefits of it like you did with that amazing trip that you're able to do. Okay, so we're going to move to the panel discussion part of the event now. So I'm going to just introduce our panellists one by one. Um, our first panellist is Professor Emily Banks, AM. She's the head of the Centre for Public Data, Health Data and Policy at the National Centre for Epidemiology at ANU. She's a public health physician and epidemiologist with an interest in chronic disease, tobacco control, healthy and ageing and Indigenous issues. Give her a big round of applause. Um, and she, she's wearing the right colour. I couldn't find yellow in my wardrobe. A clear, if I get invited back next year, I'll prom promise I have a yellow jacket. Um, our next uh, panellist is Professor Deborah Bateson AM. She joined the Daffodil Centre last year. She's co-lead of the Cervical Cancer and HPV Stream with a focus on clinical translation and implementation. Give her a round of applause. Now, I might actually get you to move up one, if you don't mind. I'll sit here, otherwise it might just ruin all our microphones. Wade, the AV guy, won't be happy if we don't sit in the right spots. Perfect. Um, our next panellist is Paul Grogan. He's an advisor to the Daffodil Centre. He's been with the Cancer Council Federation for almost 20 years. I've known him for a long time when he was doing um, media for the Cancer Council many, many years ago. Give Paul a big round of applause. Then we have Associate Professor Carolyn Nixon. She's an epidemiologist specialising in the evaluation of cancer screening. She leads the Breast Cancer Policy and Evaluation Stream and contributes to a growing program of ovarian cancer research. Give her a round of applause. And last but definitely not least, Associate Professor Mariana Weber. She leads the Daffodil Centre's Lung Cancer Evaluation and Policy Stream which aims to optimise interventions for lung cancer prevention, detection and early treatment. Give her a big round of applause too. I'll come on over. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so I'm going to start with Deb. So as you heard um, earlier, Australia is on track to be uh, the first country in the world, which is so exciting, to eliminate cervical cancer. Can you tell us what role has the Daffodil Centre played in this extraordinary achievement? And what do we need to do for research translation to ensure that we reach that goal? Thank you, Tracy. So yes, it is an absolutely extraordinary time and place to be with, with this potential to eliminate cervical cancer in the entire world within the next 100 years and here in Australia as early as 2035. And the Daffodil Centre has played an absolutely pivotal role in this extraordinary story. Karen's mentioned some of this. So uh, Karen and her team have led the modeling, which actually supported the 2030 global strategy for the elimination of cervical cancer goals. So these are goals which will set every country on the path to elimination. And they're the so-called 90-70-90 goals. So that's 90% of girls vaccinated with the HPV vaccine. That's 70% uh, of women uh, screened at least twice in their lifetime with an HPV test and 90% of those with precancer or cancers treated. Uh, so this is extraordinary. But then if we look to Australia, the daffodil has also played a key role in, in providing that modelled evidence uh, to support that major policy change we heard about in 2017, which saw the transition from two yearly pap smears to five yearly HPV testing. 
and the daffodils modeling predicted a up to 36% reduction in cervical cancer mortality mm -hmm. and incidence. Uh, so really important, but at the same time, uh, Karen and her team, along with Professor Marion Saville at the Australian Center for the Prevention of Cervical Cancer, and I will say that it's all about partnerships, of course, at all times. So they are the leads in Australia's largest randomized control trial, the COMPASS trial. Mm. Extraordinary. So this trial recruited over 76,000 women through general practice, and they were randomized either to pap smears or HPV tests. And this is what we call a sentinel experience. So it, it occurred before the rollout, around about three years before the rollout of the, of the, the um, renewed program. And it can give us that real world evidence to mm. actually support this change. And already we're waiting for the main results, but already we're, you know, it is absolutely showing uh, it's meeting its promises. Mm. Uh, so actually I will say as well, you asked about translation. So part of that compass, a sub-study of compasses is, is called Compass Plus. And this is all about getting information, getting the evidence about what women think about, what, what the impact of screening is on their lives, uh, you know, what, what, what their experience of screening is. And, you know, that question it is all about ensuring that we do talk to the communities, we understand the communities, and ensuring we can have reach through this, this, these programs. And so, again, as Karen mentioned before, the daffodil actually was pivotal in this major policy change just last year, and it's all about equity. We're on the path to elimination, but how can we make sure we're leaving no one behind? And that's around this self-collection. So now there's universal choice of self-collection using a vaginal sample without a speculum. And this is the potential to overcome many barriers for many groups. And I must say, I've had the great privilege to chair the Department of Health Self-Collection Implementation Committee and um, with fantastic representation from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women who, you know, they've got a three to four times greater risk of dying of cervical cancer. And they describe self-collection as being private and empowering. Uh, there's migrant and refugee uh, women, people with disability, the LGBTIQ and intersex community. So, but also actually this, this has the potential for women, for instance, who've experienced sexual trauma or, or uh, pelvic pain to overcome those barriers. So, you know, it's, it's really sort of heartening, fantastic work. Um, and in fact, again, talking to communities, so Associate Professor uh, Megan Smith, together with her colleague uh, Claire Nightingale at Melbourne University, they're leading a wonderful uh, NHMRC uh, study, which is actually, again, engaging with communities and working out alternative models of delivering self-collection in ways that are going to work for these communities. And so it's not just about equity here. It's also, as Karen mentioned, we're also working with our neighboring countries, which have some of the highest rates of, of cervical cancer. So Karen, myself, uh, Marion Saville, and uh, Professor Andrew Vallali from the Kirby Institute, we're co-leads on this program of work, which is called Elimination of Cervical Cancer in the Western Pacific, funded by the Mindaroo Foundation. And we're working with our partners in the ministries of health, with clinicians, with civil society and you know, grassroots organizations in Vanuatu and the Western Highlands of Papua New Guinea. And it's a program of work which we call Screen and Treat. We're working across the three pillars, but this is the Screen and Treat approach, which we've got, a, it's, a, got a, it's an implementation project, but of course, with a research overlay. And it's just extraordinary. This Screen and Treat project can reach women in the most remote areas, so remote islands in Vanuatu and, and highlands of, of Papua New Guinea. And women come along, they're offered self-collection. Mm -hmm. They can get the result, and women are queuing up, but they can get the result within 60 minutes, and then they can be offered treatment there and then by trained nurses with thermal ablation, lightweight devices. And this is literally life-changing. We're working with family planning, or we're conducting the training life-changing for women who are often dying in their early 30s, leaving children behind. So I suppose, just to finish, you know, it is about working out how we can have the greatest impact and reach the communities with the greatest needs. And I suppose, you know, I'm very pleased or well, delighted to be you know, working with, the, uh, with my colleagues on the clinical guidelines for cervical screening here, which means that, you know, we're working with GPs and nurses, so, uh, you know, to make sure we can reach the community, these GPs can reach the community everywhere. We had a wonderful piece of work with the uh, WHO Western Pacific Regional Office in the Philippines, where we helped develop the uh, regional, well, it was the strategic framework for the prevention and control of cervical cancer in the region. And actually Karen's team, again, Michael Caruana, a shout out, 
Dr. Michael is just leading this extraordinary piece of work, the elimination planning tool, which will help every country around the world to be able to work out what are their policy, you know, what are the priorities to actually eliminate in their country. Wow, that sounds amazing. amazing. <laughs> give, around, give Deb a round of applause. That is worth, definitely worth a round of applause. So I'm just going to go to Carolyn now. So we've just heard about um, the potential elimination of cervical cancer, and we know that it's only possible due to vaccination and screening. But is there something similar on the horizon for breast cancer? Can you take us through that? Thanks, Sophie. Look, I think for breast cancer, our story is, is much more similar to many other cancers. There is no single disruptor that we see, and it is such an extraordinary story, isn't it, that for cervical cancer, imagine that. Imagine if all cancers could be um, prevented with a vaccination. And in fact, I was working with the cervical cancer group at Cancer Council New South Wales um, before the vaccination, um, I guess, really came on over the horizon. Uh, and part of the reason I would say that the Daffodil Centre is able to contribute in the way that it has is that it was already doing a whole lot of work to tie together the incremental evidence around how to improve cervical cancer control. And really that's where we're at with breast cancer. We see these really important but incremental changes around things like screening, how to best screen um, for cancer, how to reach people, how to work out who should be screened and in which way, um, improvements in treatment, improvements in getting people to treatment quickly and improvements in adjuvant therapy after treatment. The challenge I think when we take this up to a public health perspective is how we tie this information together to bring about the greatest benefit with the resources that we have. So that's the work that we do in this space. And I would say um, this is similar across many of the streams of work um, in the Daffodil Centre. We hope we have the disruption that cervical cancer has seen and we will be very well positioned to assist if that arises. But in the meantime, what we're doing is trying to make the best of that whole breadth of evidence. Fantastic. Now, we heard about lung cancer. I'm going to move on to Mariana. We heard that uh, in 2025, Australia is set to roll out the new screening program for lung cancer, which is fantastic. Can you tell us what that involves and, and what work the Daffodil Centre and your work, research played in, in getting that happening and supporting that program? Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Um, so, yeah, we were very pleased and mildly shocked, <laughs> I think, to hear that a national lung cancer screening program was going to be was announced. Um, because we know we heard from Preston's talk and from Chingwe's talk that um, lung cancer is such a devastating disease in Australia. It kills more people in Australia than any other cancer. And this is largely because um, lung cancers are detected um, among people when it's at a late stage and the curative options are really limited. So the aim of lung cancer screening is to detect um, lung cancers early and when people have a better chance of um, a better prognosis. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so from the 1st of July, 2025, um, people who are aged 50 to 70 years who have a history of heavy smoking will be eligible for lung cancer screening, which is a two yearly low dose CT scan of the chest. Um, and so this, it's a little bit different to the other cancer screening programs that we currently have in Australia in that it is targeted specifically at people who are at high risk. Mm -hmm. And this issue of eligibility and how you define whether someone's at high risk has been something that we've been investigating over the last seven years at the Daffodil Centre. Um, and one example of our work at the Daffodil Centre that has directly contributed to screening decisions in this country is around this issue of defining high risk. And um, uh, at the Daffodil Centre, we had um, an evidence review on lung cancer risk factors that was um, commissioned by Cancer Australia that um, was part of the National Lung Screening Inquiry. Um, and we found that there were significant evidence gaps in um, whether people should be screened based on factors other than smoking. Um, and so this is a, an area of research that we continue to, um, to look into. But for now, the current eligibility criteria for lung cancer screening is for somebody that has um, an equivalent of 30 pack years smoking history. Um, they have to be either a current smoker or have quit within the last 10 years. 
And um, uh, further to this, our, our um, health economic modelling mm. has shown that um, lung cancer screening for this targeted group um, of people is likely to be economically beneficial in Australia. And as Karen mentioned, this was a really timely report that, that, we, um, that came out for us last year. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it must have been last year. Um, and it directly contributed to the Medical Services Advisory Committee decision to recommend lung cancer screening to the government. So yeah, we're very excited. So now the challenge for Australia is to embed lung cancer mm. screening into the health system. So there's more work to be done. Um, and one of the key factors that has been touched on with, with everybody here is really getting those priority mm. populations to participate because we know that many people or many of those populations have disproportionately high, higher rates of smoking. So they will be the ones that we want to get into to screening and we know that they're less likely to, to undertake screening. Thank you so much, Mariana. And Deb, I was just going to ask you on that issue of equity. Is anything else you wanted to add in terms of you know, making sure it's so important to improve outcomes to make sure that we have equity of access. Yes, look, it's interesting listening to, to both of you speaking, because I did work as a, in my previous role as a medical director of family planning in New South Wales. I worked uh, as a doctor in, in Fairfield. So it's, I think it's got the, mo the largest number of, of language groups in the Southern Hemisphere uh, in Dubbo and in, in Penrith. And, and certainly I saw, you know, that the impacts of the social determinants of health, I suppose you'd say, you know, far too often uh, with, with people presenting very late with symptoms of preventable cancer. Mm. And, you know, and often due to, you know, well, poverty, lack of health literacy, not knowing, you know, when to seek help, where to go. And, and also, you know, lack of sort of culturally safe uh, services. So there are many challenges. So mm. I suppose my main addition really and I've touched on it before we've all touched on it is actually ensuring that we do uh, bring the community in early when we're planning programs that we do have a meaningful involvement of mm -hmm. the people that we're aiming to serve the most marginal marginalized groups and I suppose perhaps I'll just touch briefly on a, a project which is uh, running alongside Associate Professor Megan Smith's project it's an, an HMRC project um, which is a privilege to lead, which is called Screen Equal, and it's about optimising cervical screening for uh, people with intellectual disability. So to participate, but also the experience of screening. And we're, everything is co-designed. Actually, we've got wonderful researchers, including researcher Julie Loblinsk uh, with intellectual disability. So she holds it all to account. And it is, you know, we're working to um, co-design information, resources and training for, for people with intellectual disability, their families and carers and GPs and nurses. So I think it's just it is having those those voices and not just voices actions <laughs> um, early early, early on. on exactly thank you very much mm -hmm. um, next to Carolyn the the Daffodil Centre has been um, is heading up a major government funded project looking at whether breast cancer screening could be personalised and adjusted to different risk factors can you give us a bit of a sense about that project and why the Daffodil Centre has been such a great place to do that work. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Yeah, so we the project is called the ROSA Project, which um, is an acronym that stands for the Roadmap to Optimising Screening in Australia, brackets, breast. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a more workable acronym than the one we had before. But um, back in 2018, um, we uh, were first commissioned by the Australian Government Department of Health to scope out the question of um, considering a more risk-based approach to breast cancer screening in Australia. Uh, and we started that work by setting up a large um, advisory group from um, many disciplines across the sector and doing some scoping pieces to look at what was known, what was not known, and to understand the health services that were in place at the moment. So we weren't focusing only on the breast screen program, but also on surveillance that happens outside the breast screen program and how those different services interconnect, um, both in terms of resourcing and in terms of how the individual might move between them. So having done that work, we set up our first roadmap, suggesting a four to five year program about priority areas to progress so that we could potentially shift towards a more personalised approach to risk um, to breast screening. And, and over the years that followed, we were then commissioned to pro progress um, different areas of that work. Um, and so, look, it's been terrific to, to do that work at the Daffodil Centre because it's really broad 
in scope. It has included things like systematic reviews, and we have worked with the systematic review team within the Daffodil Centre to progress that work in ways that we couldn't if we'd used our own skill sets with just within my stream. So being able to collaborate with those experts and to have them within the centre was just fantastic. Um, we did a piece of work with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and Breast Screen to look at the information that is already collected by Breast Screen Services and what it would take to collect a bit more information so that women's risk could be assessed and also so that one could monitor any significant changes to the Breast Screen program from an equity perspective. Um, and that piece of work, I kind of really imagine I could have, in a way, designed and believed that I could do that work if I had been, before I was working at Cancer Council, an academic working within a university because I had my peers around me who'd done, done this extraordinary work with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare or with other cancer screening programs and taking advice and seeing how they do things really sort of helped guide that work and ensure its quality. Um, so we've also done modelling work and we've heard a bit about all the different modelling that happens at, at Cancer Council. That's um, been a part of my work too. And um, bringing that into the Daffodil Centre, I think it's just fabulous because we, when, whenever we are designing models to look at specific questions, we really want to make sure that we're um, specifying them and validating them as well as possible. And that means drawing on experts from a range of disciplines. And now with, through this collaboration with the Daffodil Centre, we've got an even greater body of experts right there that we can draw on um, for their expertise. So at this point, we've produced a five-year roadmap looking forward and a set of recommendations about the activities that would be required to shift towards a more risk-based screening program in Australia. Those are with the Department of Health at the moment for consideration, so I can't reveal them, unfortunately. Um, but we are really excited. We think um, we're on the cusp of a really significant change, which even without a disruptor, I think um, the Daffodil Centre's enabled um, Australia really to be able to sort of look forward and, and potentially make some bold steps. That's fascinating. Well, we look forward to an update when you're able to give us that insight I'd love information. To, Sophie, Thank I'd you. love to. And so, Mariana, just quickly to you, um, why is it so important that we we look at these risk tools and that they evolve as, as we learn more? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be the future of cancer screening, I think. And it, it's already, I mean, as you've heard before, targeting people at high risk is key to the lung cancer screening program. But being able to minimise the harms of screening and maximise the benefits is really where we're headed. And it's always going to be that trade-off between minimising harms and maximising benefits and reducing the number needed to screen to, to prevent one cancer death. And so that's, that's another area that we're looking into with lung cancer screening is really looking at risk prediction tools and how we can embed them in the health system because we know there are tools out there. They're already being used in other jurisdictions in Canada and the UK for lung screening. They've been using risk, they use risk prediction tools. And I think one of the hurdles here in Australia was that there was that lack of, I guess, confidence in being able to embed that into the health system. So that's sort of the challenge for us in lung, but I know that other yeah, screening pro uh, programs are heading <laughs> the same way. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I might move on to Emily now. So Emily, you're a medical doctor and an epidemiologist. You head, as I mentioned, the, the research centre at ANU, and you're also a visiting professor at the University of Oxford. H how do all the pieces fit together that you've heard to dramatically improve cancer outcomes based on what you've heard today and your, and your own work as well? So... Um... <clears throat> Thanks, Sophie. And I just want to say what an honour it is to be here and to see things evolving. I know um, Karen and I met in Oxford um, when she was a student there and to see what's, you know, what uh, she's been part of bringing about is just, it's breathtaking and it's also a real honour to be here. So 
Um, when I think about, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist and a public health doctor, and when I think about improving cancer care that's, and, and cancer outcomes, it's essentially about truly making a difference on the ground. And the question about what truly makes a difference on the ground, I think about sort of what, what your goals are, what the ingredients are, and what the approach is. Um, and I'll cut to the chase, keep on doing what you're doing. Okay, <laughs> that's, our, that's my, my first thing. So really, it's about the appropriate evidence and then actually having the health system and the community be able to engage to take appropriate action. Those two things together, it sounds basic, but what you can also see is you require incredibly detailed uh, knowledge across multiple sort of areas and then very what I would call granular activities because it's about knowing that you need to quit smoking, but then getting down to every single person who is a smoker and helping them and, and actually having all of the population activities that help that person to do that. So it's comprehensive and it's complex. Um, so, so your goals are really about the best possible evidence and the outcomes. The, the ingredients, you need great leadership you need fantastic partnerships. We've all heard about that. You need the people who are the end users of the evidence to be there. Um, and you also need great teams. So if you think about the Daffodil Centre, you've got teams of people, the systematic review team, the, all the different streams and teams together. It's not about an individual um, activity. You need great infrastructure. You need really good data systems. You need really good modelling. You need all those things as well. So, so leadership, partnerships, teams and infrastructure, put that together. And then in terms of, of the approach, you have to all be working together. You have to have those partnerships from start to finish. Um, you need to have um, what I would see you're doing really well at the, the Daffodil Centre is you have these case studies. In a way, you've got the, the cervical cancer example from start to finish that you can then apply to other cancers, to other outcomes. Um, so so you know, in terms of your approach, um, you know, there's all the ingredients, but then there's also having case studies that demonstrate it. The other thing is, I think what a lot of people don't realise is the importance of political intelligence and actually making things happen on the ground. So you could be working, as uh, Carolyn said, you could be working in, in isolation, being a boffin, you know, you've got your paper out, you can sit in your panelled study, um, you know, have a glass of sherry or not. Um, <laughs> But really, if you're not part of a big team that knows that that piece of information has this implication to be framed in this particular way, to take this action, to encourage this minister to make that decision, to actually be able to engage the community to make a difference. So that, that political intelligence. And I think one of the things I would be suggesting um, even more than what you're doing is a sense of how can you codify that? How can you actually make what you have done accessible and able to be done by other people because at the moment a lot of it is embodied in individuals or teams of people who are really inspiring but it's it's not necessarily a scalable thing and then the other thing I would say for making a difference in cancer control is really focusing on some of the big no-brainers all right so Warren Buffett said uh, the best you know the best moves are not necessarily those that are greeted with applause uh, beware. In fact, he said, beware the moves that are, are greeted with applause. The best moves are greeted with yawns. So um, I'm not saying you should be boring, but what I am saying is that, for example, I work on tobacco control. One of the main reasons I work on tobacco control is that it is our leading cause of burden of disease in Australia. It's responsible for 50% of deaths in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 45 and over. It's a massive problem and we're not doing enough about it. It's a great big no-brainer. If I say I'm working on tobacco control, people go, oh, but, you know, isn't that obvious? So I think that we need to be prepared to go hard on the things that matter and that are, are important. And it's really, really important to make sure that you're going, even if they are small incremental steps in the right direction, that's much better than really going rapidly in the wrong direction. Mm. Um, so anyway, I would say to circle back, keep on doing what the Daffodil Centre is doing, but think about how you can scale it even more and how you can um, work even harder with the community, but also to educate people around you. Fantastic. Give Emily a big round of applause. <laughs> Great advice there. Great advice there. Uh, so, Paul, we'll go to you next. How, how do we get, we've heard about the importance of engaging engaging decision makers um, about the important work that's being done for cancer control. How do we get governments to invest in 
evidence-based interventions to, to reduce the risk of cancer and improve clinical outcomes. We, we know there's already a lot of evidence already out there. So why do we need to wait for more evidence? How do we get governments to act on the existing evidence we already have? It's a, oh, oh, there, wow, I was expecting that. Sorry. It's a, it's a great question. And I saw it come in thanks to the person that was yes, de-identifying that came in as a question the from, the, from the audience. So thank you. I wish we knew. Um, I can, I can, before I try to answer it, um, I just want to provide a little bit of context. First, you know, 20 years of being in our sector, being the Cancer Council and, and 10 years before that as a government's been doctor and gatekeeper, pri primarily for the Department of Health. I, I can say hand on heart, all politicians want to do good things in cancer. However, um, just to put it in a bit of context, cancer causes one in three deaths in Australia. It, it accounts for about one fifteenth of overall health and medical expenditure, health system expenditure in the country, about one twelfth of all health and medical research expenditure across all sectors. They're pre-COVID figures, so those proportions will have fallen because of the necessary investment in COVID. So don't let anybody in public office say we're doing everything we can because they are not based on those indicators. So um, that's a kind of a point of fact. The reasons they say no, mainly, well, there's mainly three reasons. Um, they'll say they disagree with the evidence. They'll say they kind of agree with the evidence, but making the decisions required to bring about necessary change are unpalatable and won't go down well with more powerful stakeholders or they say we haven't got the money. And those three things can interact in different ways. So how do you cut through those three barriers? As I said, I wish I, wish I knew. Uh, if, if I had an hour, I'd take you through 30 years of decisions and where independent research, my colleagues will be rolling their eyes thinking, thank God we haven't got an hour. Um, uh -huh. So I'll single out a couple of examples if I can, I'll just try and think. So, so one that's quite timely for, um, for and, and it's got nationally recognisable for anyone who's been watching cricket and tennis over the past two, few weeks, you probably caught a glimpse of Tim Tim is the 50-year-old man walking his dog who has an epiphany where he should use his fecal local blood test uh, to screen for bowel cancer. Uh, can, hands up if anyone's seen Tim walking the dog. One person avoided me. It's a, that campaign's a evaluating yeah. remarkably well given the, um, the, the recognition factor. Anyway, anyway, point of, point of fact, Tim may have found his way onto our TV screen eventually, but he's only there now and he only got there when he first got there in 2019 because of one study. And I, I can say this because I was kind of outside Malcolm Turnbull's office trying to make the case for the funding for it. And if Jay Bin Liu, who led that study, fantastic researcher in our gastrointestinal stream, if Jay Bin's in the audience watching, she'll remember my chaotic frenetic phone calls outside Malcolm, even though I'm a co-author on that paper, I'm ringing Jay Bin to make sure I got the detail right. So if you're listening, Jay Bin, I hope you recall that that morning with great affection like, like I do. Um, I'm not trying to be funny here, honestly. Many years in the, many years in the health department and also in our sector, I've, I've never heard so much interest around an individual paper like I did with that one. And this is where I'm not trying to be funny. If you think about the ad with Tim, at that time, I lost count on the number of people who were texting me saying, can you resend the summary of that Lou paper? I, honestly, I'm not, this is not <laughs> trying to be funny. I didn't pick up on it at the time because, it, you know, JB and Lou, L-E-W, but yeah. it was, yeah, we were, in it, people wanted to get access to that paper. Uh, we had to wait for it to be published. But it really was the main reason that it was initially the, the, um, the Turnbull and then the Morrison governments did something that had never been done before, which was to provide $10 million directly to a not-for-profit to run a national campaign. Ne never been done before. And when Greg Hunt made the announcement, he alluded to the really impressive numbers in Jabin's paper, which was if we could get participation up to 60%, we would save 84,000 lives going forward. So that, <laughs> that just really shows that the evidence can make a massive difference. If yes. it gets into the right hands and the right ears and it can actually yes. be the real game yeah. changer. Yeah, going so it's a, no, it's a, and it's a, it, it's, it's a standout example because, because it's, because it's recognisable, but that's going to be the key to, it's, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the key to getting results and moving that dial, which we've talked about today, there's 1.45 million deaths which Australia is facing if nothing changes. The, the key to moving that dial is going to be independent research and advocacy working together. And that's across the whole system as well. It's, it's primary prevention, the, 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 the big cultural changes required for more effective primary prevention, but right through to, to you know, to patient care, all of those things. And, and, if, and if anyone's thinking, oh, well, you know, some of these, some of these things are the result of, you know, very rigorous independent processes that, that that is true in the in the sense that um you know the, the big subsidy schemes like medicare and, and pbs or whatever else they there they are informed through analysis that's delivered through statutory and non-statutory committees and everything else but always remember there is still a degree of cabinet discretion over these things so while someone in public office you know in cabinet or whatever else isn't likely to say to those committees we don't agree with your evidence they can say we can't afford it so mm. 
And so where, where are you prioritising your expenditure? They can the money when they want to, is yes, what you're saying. Yes, as, as we saw with COVID. So, so to bring about that system level change that we need to really move that dial, and as I said, it's right across the spectrum from primary prevention through to improve survivorship, all of those things, we need to do more of what we're doing here because I, I've been lucky enough to see it up close, again, as a former government gatekeeper and spin doctor, but also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, working for the Cancer Council Federation for 20 years. That, that's going to be the key and partnership and collaboration. And it's great having Emily here as a great long-standing partner. We're, we're, I mean, our, our centre is based on partnership, but we need to work more effectively with other collaborators as well, uh, excuse me, to, to position the stuff that requires independent research and independent advocacy to really cut through all of, all of those things, including, as I said, the underfunding. And that sense of collaboration and partnership is something that governments really do appreciate, though, don't they? They they Because I've had that feedback when I've interviewed health ministers and, and previous health ministers that they really appreciate when people come in as a united front, you know, all with the same ask and the same wanting the same thing rather than being competing, you know, competing different people wanting different priorities. Yes, well, I can flip that too. They sometimes use the opposite as an excuse for not doing things when it's convenient as well, saying, oh, you're all kind of saying different things. And I, again, I've been in the tent on both sides where, um, as well as being a, a gatekeeper in government. So yes, it, it is certainly better if, if, if everyone is making the same, the same case, but just always maintain a degree of cynicism around reasons for saying no because it's usually those other three things it's not so much oh you're all saying different things i'm not going to do anything i mean we hear that all the time but usually it comes down to again not wanting to spend the money not wanting to make a difficult decision or having interesting views on what evidence is excellent give paul a big round of applause for a great insight so look the time has absolutely flown we're almost at the end of our um event i just wanted to briefly this is a question without notice to each of the panelists just the their one last thought for the audience, both here and, and watching online, um, about what you would like to see to, to move the, the uh, dial on cancer control. We'll start just, just one last sentence to sum everything up from each of you. Marion, what's your, your main thing? Everyone? I think uh, taking some um, inspiration from Emily, I think working together across different expertise and different organisations is probably really where we're going to make the biggest difference. Thank you. Carolyn? Um, I'd like to see, I guess, uh, looking at a life course perspective, making the most of every opportunity where people engage with health services to try to prevent and advise around cancer. And Paul, you've given us some great thoughts, but just your one last thought. Yeah, so we we need to capture the public imagination around what the eureka moments are in cancer control right across the spectrum. And there's, there's good reason that we all kind of trade on these ideas of laboratory research and all of these things. But just remember all of those eureka moments and the first vaguely successful tests around fecal local blood testing were in the 1970s. So it's, here we are now with Tim on TV getting people to try to use it. Even when things are subsidised in the system, doesn't always mean they get to the people who need it most. So you know, that's why health services research is so important as well. So we've really got to work as a community to make sure things get to the people who need them most, according to the evidence. Thanks, Paul. And Deb? So mine is bringing in the communities we need to reach. We're aiming to serve uh, in a meaningful way right from the very beginning. Thank you. And Emily, finally? So I would love to see a way of getting much more buy-in about prevention in the community. I think one of the issues in public health and cancer control is that when we're really successful, it's measured by absence. And so um, the people who've actually had uh, lung cancer prevented because smoking's gone down or breast cancer prevented because of more judicious use of hormonal therapy for the menopause, they don't know who they are. Mm. They're not tearfully looking up into the eyes of the, of the health minister and going, I would have been a goner, but for your <laughs> tobacco control policies. And we have... We have this way of, you know, we are swayed by anecdotes as well as statistics, but we don't capture the beauty, the, the, the um, we don't capture the emotion of prevention in the way that we capture the emotion of sort of saving people's lives mm. who have disease. So I think that there's a really big bit of work that's, that needs to be done alongside those incredible statistics that actually brings that heart and soul of prevention into the community because we're definitely not doing enough. We're definitely not preventing enough. And I know when I worked as a doctor in a hospital, the one thing that people said, you know, who had cancer there was, I wish I'd never had this, mm. right? I mean, they obviously said, I want really good treatment, now I've got it. But they did say, I wish I'd never had this. But there's lots of people walking around out there who don't have it, but they don't know that they're actually in that position of being that grateful person. So I would love to see more done in a multidisciplinary way 
to capture hearts and minds about prevention. Yeah, fantastic. Give Emily a round of applause. Give our whole panel a round of applause. So much, so much great food for thought there from everybody. And thank you all for being in the audience today and giving up your time and everyone watching online as well. Um, that's the end of the formal part of today's proceedings. But for those of us who are here in the room, we'd love you all to join us for morning tea on level four. And thank you for being here and we'll see you next year. Thanks everybody. Thank you so